It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord, amen? Yes. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. I mean, worship was amazing, was it not? And it's an honor to be able to bring God's word today. If we haven't met, my name is Mike, and I'd love to meet you after service. Come on up front, shake my hand, say hi. I can answer any questions you may have, uh, any cries of outrage, whatever it may be. I can answer those for you, all right? Before we get into the word today, I'm going to open up in prayer, and then we'll dive right in, all right? We've got a lot to go over, so hopefully we can get out on time, all right? So, Father God, I just, uh, I come to you first and foremost and give you all the glory and all the praise for everything that you do, Father. It is all because of you, and we only want to do what it is that you have for each and every one of us. Father, I pray, just as I do each and every time I come up here, remove me from the stage. Get rid of me, get rid of anything that's of me, and let your words be heard, and only your words. Soften each and every one of our hearts. Give us ears to hear what it is that you have for us to hear, Father. Father, I pray that this word that you have put on my heart, that this will change and transform lives in here. That we'll be able not to live by the flesh, but to live by the spirit and the spirit alone. Father, I pray for each and every one of us that we can hear exactly what it is that you're speaking to us. For Father, I give you all the praise and all the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the last time I was up here, I talked about the book of Titus. And I told you there's two of the most amazing gospel messages in that book. There's 46 verses in there and there's two great gospel messages. I know we're in the book of James, but I want to start here because it's going to set the stage for where we're at. So in Titus 3, Paul opens up with this word right here. He says, remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to slander no one. Not to be contentious, to be gentle, showing every consideration for all people. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts, pleasures, spending our life in malice, envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we did in righteousness, but in accordance with his mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he richly poured out upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, we, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. You see, Paul's telling Titus, remind them. Remind them, remind them. Remind them that you once were foolish. You once were disobedient. You once were enslaved to various lusts. You once were hateful. You once hated one another. But when the kindness of the Lord came, that changes. You are not that old person anymore. You are a new creation. This is not you anymore. He's saying remind them. Remind them of this. And he says remind them that this wasn't anything on the basis of their deeds. Christ just... The Father just richly poured it out. It was nothing that they did. He said, remind them of this, remind them of this, remind them of this. So why do I say that? Because James is this book as well. James is a book to remind you each and every day. It's not a book about salvation. It's a book about your sanctification, about the works, about the way you're supposed to be living after you're saved. It's this book that calls you to watch your tongue. It's a book that calls you to have joy. It's a book that tells you, hey, even the demons believe in Jesus. It's a book that tells you believing's not enough. Many people will say, Lord, Lord. It's a difference between believing and trusting in him. This is a book that reminds you of the way you're supposed to be living. That's why it's so amazing that we put this series in place many months ago and all this stuff is aligning right now. This is the book that talks about each and every one of this stuff. You see, this isn't a book that you should just read when you're going through your reading plan. This isn't a book that you should just read when we have a series on it. I challenge you. There's 31 Proverbs. You should be reading one of those a day. This has got five books in it. Monday through Friday, read this book. But don't just read it for knowledge. Let it change and transform you. 
If you don't take this word and put it inside of you and let it change and transform you, it's useless. It's absolutely useless. You're wasting your time. You need to apply this to your life. That's what we're going to talk about. So as Pastor Adam said, this is a book of action, right? This is a book to, of action for us. He talked about joy through trials. I'm going to talk about temptations today. We're going to talk about the temptations. We're going to talk about what that looks like. How can we overcome these temptations? It's about knowledge. It's about knowledge. It's about understanding the word. It's about knowing where these temptations come from. It's about knowing that you can take every thought captive. But how do we know this? It's about spending time in his word. It's about spending time with him each and every day. If all you're doing is coming here to get filled up and that's the only thing you're doing, you're wrong. You're wrong. You don't feed a baby once a week. Right? We need to be in his word daily so we can understand that. Let me put it this way. Let me put it this way. When you're in school and there was a pop quiz that was given to you, right? If that pop quiz was, was given and you weren't prepared, you weren't studied up, you didn't know the material for yourself, you didn't understand it, and all you did was base it off from what somebody told you, followed after what somebody said, listened to their words off from it, cheated off from their paper, and hopefully you would just squeak by. When that pop quiz came, there was fear, there's worry, there's, there's no joy in the midst of that, right? But when that pop quiz comes and you're prepared, you know the word for yourself. You've studied up the material. You know what's going on. You don't need the words from anybody else. You haven't looked at it. You know it. You know what's going to happen. You know where the victory is already at. You understand? You're ready. You're prepared. You can go through it. There's no way I could be up here right now in a wheelchair preaching and go through what I went through if I wasn't already prepared beforehand. Before that trial came, now that it wasn't all easy, right? There's these ups and downs. But I know where my joy's at. I know where the victory's at, right? I know who's ultimately in control. And that's what we're talking about today, right? Being prepared. That's why I said this is an internal fight that we've had. We've, we're now turning from these external trials that are going on to now this internal fight that happens to us, these temptations. Are you ready to dig into James? Yes. All right. James 1. We're going to start verse 13. It says no one, all right, it's going to be a long day, no one, it doesn't say pastor, it doesn't say media booth personnel, parking lot team, you in the back row, it doesn't say male, female, it doesn't say anything, it says no one, that means each and every one of us, no one, is to say when he is tempted, stop again. Words matter. I tell my kids all the time. Every word that comes out of your mouth, everything that you say matters. It has weight and it means something. James doesn't use the, use the word if. He doesn't say no one if. Because if he said if, that would mean well, maybe it will, maybe it won't. Who knows? It hasn't happened yet. We don't know if it will. It may look different. Who knows? He uses the word when, which means each and every one of you are going to be tempted. It's going to happen, right? Spoiler alert. It's going to happen in your life. I mean, today you may have already been tempted to yell at somebody in traffic coming here to get your anger going already, right? If it's football season that's coming up, you may be tempted in service to make sure your fantasy team's okay. It's true. It's sad. We laugh, but it's true. If you have the Jaguars, it's not set. You may be sitting in here looking at your Facebook to update your status, to make sure people liked your stuff or didn't like your stuff, or who's talking about what or what's going on or who said this. Did my picture get on there? You may be tempted right now to go, man, I'm so glad my wife's listening. I'm so glad my husband's listening. I wish my kids were here. Listen for yourself. Yeah. Right? You may be tempted already today. You may be tempted to get up and leave right now. 
I mean, I want to roll out right now. Right? These are these temptations that come. But where does this temptation come from, right? Where is this coming from? Well, let's keep going. No one is to say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. Let's look at this. Let's look at Luke 4. Give me a second. I brought just me in the Bible today, so it's going to be a minute. Luke 4 is right after Jesus was baptized. This is right when he's starting the ministry, right? Now Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the, Holy, by the Spirit in the wilderness. There's a key. Who is he being led by? The Spirit, not the flesh. He's being led by the Spirit in the wilderness. Now listen. For 40 days being tempted by the devil. Matthew says the tempter. So where is the temptation coming from? Satan, right? Him and his minions, right? Putting stuff in your minds. This battle that happens each and every day. These temptations that come in front of you. Check it out. Let's keep reading. He ate nothing during those days. So that's 40 days. And when they had ended, he was hungry. I couldn't imagine, right? He was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell the stone to become bread. Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. And he led him up, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. The devil said to him, I will give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I'll give it to whoever I want. Therefore, if you worship before me, I shall, it shall all be yours. Jesus replied to him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And he brought him into Jerusalem, had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. He said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will give angels orders concerning you to protect you, and on their hands they will lift you up so that you not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered and said to him, it has been stated, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And so when the devil had finished every temptation, he left them until an opportune time. So what we can't do when we're being tempted, what we can't say is God's tempting me in this. God's put this on me in this aspect. He didn't. And here's the thing. What did the enemy do? In James 14, it says, but each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. The key to that whole thing is enticed. Another word for enticed is lure, bait. It's this mindset of going fishing, right? My kids just were talking about fishing the other day. It's about putting this fake lure on there or even this real lure on a hook and make it look good, right? Well, these young fish, they're easy to catch. They don't know anything. They don't know any better. They don't know what's real. They don't know what's fake. They just go after it, right? But the older ones, the wiser ones, the ones that's been around the block, i.e. the ones that are studying, right, that understand are walking by the Spirit, right, you can't catch those things. And Jesus didn't take the bait that was out there. Look at it. In Luke, it says he was hungry. The very next thing Satan did was put a bait of food out there. Change this and you're going to get some bread. I'm going to stop your hunger. It all looks good, right? But Jesus did not take the bait. He didn't go after it. He wasn't enticed into this. It didn't turn into this lust, right? We think of this lust as this sexual in nature sometimes lust. It's way, way more than that, right? You see, we have this freedom in Christ, right? We have this freedom to do basically what we want to do as long as it aligns with the Father, right? But too often, I say we, this is what I say, we have free will to pick whichever sin we're going to do. Right? I mean, think about it. We have debates about if I can lose my salvation or not, if I'm saved or not saved. I'm done with that debate. Let me tell you something. We have that debate because we want to figure out where the line is and get right on this line before I lose my salvation. 
That's not what we're called to do. We're called to get as far away from sin as we possibly can. So it doesn't matter if you can lose your salvation or not. That's what we're called to do, right? This is the freedom that we have. So what's it mean? What's this freedom? Galatians. Galatians 5. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. Jesus didn't walk by the flesh. He quoted scripture right back at Satan, right? He was walking by the spirit. It says, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's what we're called to. Keep reading. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the desire of the flesh is against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, in order to keep you from doing whatever you want. It's not about you anymore. It's not about your wants, your desires, your needs, what you think anymore. It's about aligning with the Father's will. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are sexual immorality, impurity, indecent behavior, idolatry, witchcraft, hostilities, strife, jealousies, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, Envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. There's so many temptations just around each and every one of those that I just said. And it leads us to try and find this line, where can I go? How far can I get before it's too much? And we're not called to do that. This is what we're called. But the fruit of the Spirit is love Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Please be tempted by each and every one of those. Someone's going to take those words out of context. Be tempted by each and every one of those each and every day of your life. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let's follow the Spirit as well. Let's not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Our flesh has been crucified, but the battle is in our mind each and every day. And if we don't know where our identity is at, we'll get lost. We put our identity in each and one of these things that we chase after, that we're tempted by, and there's where our identity is found at. And when that's taken away, then we're just, we don't know what's going on. If you don't know your identity, this is a plug for the class that's coming up. If you don't know your identity, go to the identity class. Because everything starts with your identity. You've got to know where your identity is at. You cannot put your identity into your work, into your family, into whatever other things that you want to put your identity into. Your past. Some people like to put their identity in who they were. You're a new creation. These are some of the things that we're tempted by. Let me give you some others. Some people, it's money. Some of us are tempted by money, right? We'll take money from wherever we could take money. We'll get, it's just money, money, money. And Satan keeps putting this bait out there. Everything looks good, looks fine, right? We'll take money from places we shouldn't take it. We'll take money that we just think we're entitled to to take it. We'll do whatever we want to get, 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 which leads to greed. We're not called to that. That's where the lust then is birthed, right? In James, in James uh, 15, he says, when the lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it has run its course, brings forth death. That's where that lust gets conceived into this greed, and you just want, you want, you want. Or you focus on things that you, oh man, I could have done this better. I could have had more here. I could have had this money here. Let me give you an example of this in my life. So this was about 2019 time frame. And I was like, man, 
if I would have just put my money into like crypto, if I would just put all of it in there, not just some, I'd be so rich. I'd be such a rich guy right now. I just really messed up. And in 2020, we were able to build our house that we're in right now. And we moved into it December of 2020. And we're, this is probably January time frame. So we're sitting on the floor in front of our fireplace in our new house. It's Rach, myself, the three kids, Caitlin, Ryan, and Ethan. And we're sitting down there. And I've been going through this like, man, I could have had so much more. We could have been so much richer. And all I hear is the words, it's enough. It's enough. And at that moment, I realized what rich really was. Rich was my wife sitting next to me, my three kids sitting there. It wasn't the house, not the fireplace, none of that stuff. It was my family. It was because I was able to be there still after getting ran over from a truck, gracious enough that the Lord left me stay here. That's what rich is. We get a mindset about what rich really looks like. And it's not that. Let me tell you another one. Sometimes it's about what other people have or what other people are doing or where they're going or the life that they have. I'm talking about Facebook and Instagram. I got rid of that thing a week ago. I told you, if I'm preaching a message, he's working on me, just like he works on each and every one of us, right? I got rid of that a week ago because I realized either A, there's a bunch of keyboard warriors, pirates out there that say whatever they want behind a keyboard but won't actually say it in person because yeah. they can hide behind a screen, yeah. right? Yeah. And then it gets me upset, but I'm too wise to respond because I know that's not the right thing to do. <laughs> I just write it in my notes. <laughs> I ask Rach, can I post this? And she says, no. <laughs> right? This is what we do. And I realized it's building this anger inside of me. Like, why are you doing this? What are you doing? And that anger is then going into, not that my kids were doing something wrong, or they just see the anger in me, and I'm like, this is not good. It's, it's been freeing, people. I'm telling you, it's been great. Get rid of Facebook and Instagram, right? These are the things, or how about this? Here's another one, this will get you. People just want knowledge. They wanna know, they wanna be in the know. And I'm not talking good knowledge. I'm talking, they gonna know everything about everybody. What's going on? Or they want to spread it about everybody. What's going on? That's called gossip, folks. Some of you will do this. Dear Lord, I know not everybody knows, but Mike's going through an addiction right now. His, his family's struggling. His wife, I don't know if she's going to stay. Father, I know not everybody knows, but please, please just be with them. You just gossiped in prayer. You didn't even know you did it, but you gossiped in prayer. Stop gossiping. I, I literally had to tell somebody, no, I'm not leaving the church because they thought I was going. Just because my right leg's gone does not mean I'm gone. Stop gossiping because it turns into lies. In Proverbs, the Lord says, literally, he hates a lying tongue, comma, the shedding of innocent blood. It's right there. He hates a lying tongue. Shut the mouth, right? And stop talking. I'm going to give you a caveat. If you want to talk and you can't help but talking, Galatians 5. Let's not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Now listen to Galatians 6. I don't know if it's up there. It may be. But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. I give you full permission to gossip about the cross. Tell every single person that you know about the cross. Please do. Tell them what Jesus did for them. Tell them what he's done in your life, how he changed and transformed you, how I once was an arrogant, angry guy that's been changed and transformed. Right? Tell them. Gossip about that. That's what I want you to do. Amen? Amen. 
this is what you're not supposed, this is also what you're supposed to do. Because this will lead to this. Ephesians 4 tells us, let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but there is any good word for edification according to the need of the moment, say that, so that it will give grace to those who hear it. I have been living by this verse lately by so much. If it's not going to give life, if it's not going to build somebody up, if it's going to just tear down, because I'm telling you, gossip is just about protecting your image, your wants, your desires, and everything about you. It's about building people up, edification, giving glory to God, gossip about him. That's what it's about. Amen? That is what we were called to do. So you see, Jesus followed the spirit. He didn't follow the flesh in any of his stuff. He wasn't enticed by it, right? That's not what he was going for. Let me tell you this. We were all chosen by God. We were justified by God and we'll be glorified. But whether or not you reach spiritual maturity, that's an open question. Because it depends on whether or not you're going to submit You're going to submit to the willingness, your willingness to submit or yield to the Spirit's direction. Are you going to listen to where the Spirit's leading you? Are you going to do as he's called you to do? I'm going to wrap this all up. The band can start coming up. I'm going to wrap this all up with two stories here. One story, one from the Bible. Here's how this works. If a bird flies over your head, that bird could be anything. Whatever your sin is, whatever that temptation is, whatever that case may be, this bird flies over you. You had no choice in the matter. It's just there. You have two choices. Are you going to turn away from that and walk by the Spirit? Are you going to carry on and do what the Lord's called you to do? Or are you going to keep going back to that bird? Is that image going to keep coming back to you? Are you going to keep chasing after the flesh? And is it going to birth into the sin aspect? And this last one that I want to talk about as the band gets ready is in 2 Samuel. As I was preparing for this message about temptation, this is a perfect example of what not to do and also of what to do when you failed aspect. So David, right, he's king right now. This is the guy Right? He was after the Lord's heart right here. He's a man after God's heart. He says, now at evening time, David got up from his bed, walked around on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful in appearance. At that moment, that bird flew over. At that moment, the enemy is trying to entice David at this time. And he sees her, right? And she's beautiful. David's got a choice. David sends servants to inquire about her. Still nothing wrong, right? But he finds out it's Uriah's wife. And at that moment, he's got a choice. What does he want to do? This temptation comes and does he take every thought captive or does he carry on? And what's he do? He says, bring her to me. Right? Sleeps with her. She gets pregnant. He finds out. And now he can do something, right? All right, he can fess up, do whatever, but no. Now he sends for Uriah to come back. He's still trying to cover this up. It's conceived now, right? It's hiding. It's not really in broad daylight. It's in secret. He's trying to get Uriah to come back and sleep with his wife so that way. But Bathsheba already knows. You can't hide it, right? You can't hide it. You're not going to hide your temptation from the Lord aspect, right? He's already going to know. He already sees. Comes back and it doesn't work. So what happens is... David, in the morning, he wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hands of Uriah. This will preach for an hour. Uriah was carrying his own death sentence in his hand, which means he trusted David so much, he didn't open the letter because he thought David had his back and was looking out for him and had the best interest. He never would have thought David would do this to him. But the letter said, station your eye in the front line of the, f- of the f- fiercest battle. Pull back from him so that he be struck and killed. Sends him out there and he dies. And after the mourning of Bathsheba, after she mourns and griefs, 
David takes her as wife. This is the best part of the story. This is where we need a Nathan in our life. We need somebody that can speak into our life. When they see us going down the wrong path, please, if you ever see me going down the wrong path, speak into my life because don't let me go down. Nathan comes to him and tells him, hey man, there was two men in the city, one wealthy, the other poor. The wealthy man had a great many flocks of herds. Poor man had nothing except a little you, little lamb. What happens, the rich man takes the poor man's you, the poor man's lamb, takes it and gives it to the traveler. David, not recognizing yet, burning with anger, right? He says, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this certainly deserves to die because he did this. Nathan said, you yourself are the man. You did it. That's you. What you just did with Bathsheba. Calls him out on it right there. He goes on to say, you yourself are the man. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. It is I who anointed you as king over Israel. This is I who rescued you from the hand of Saul. I also gave you your master's house, put your master's wives into your care, and I gave you the house of Israel and Judah, and if that had been too little, I would have added you many more like these. He's telling them all your stuff came from the Lord. The Lord gave you everything that is good, and you're trying to go get more and more and more of what you think you need. And he goes on and he says, indeed you did this secretly, but I will do this thing before Israel in an open daylight. And David then at that point realizes and says, I've sinned against the Lord. I've sinned against the Lord. He repents and Nathan goes, it's okay. The Lord's not gonna strike you dead. However, you did this, there's repercussions for it. Who knows if you continue to live a life in sin, there's repercussions for that aspect. There's a life that can lead to death then. Right? In the natural aspect. We must be quick to repent, to turn back. And sure enough, as you know the story, David's son with Bathsheba passes away. And David's mourning while he's still alive. He's fasting. But as soon as he finds out that the son has passed, he gets up, he worships the Lord, and he goes on. And he says, I can't bring him back now, but I'll surely go to him. And he continues to worship. This is what I'm calling you to do today. If you realize the Lord's speaking to you, you're like, man, I've been chasing after these things. Whatever it may be, whatever you are lusting after that's not the Lord, whatever has become this idol in your life, this temptation that dangles in front of you, I pray the Lord's revealing it to you right now. Whether that's money, your family, the knowledge of gospel, of, of uh, gossip. Whatever this is that's leading you this way, that's leading you away from Christ, I pray you can come up here. Can I have the prayer team come forward right now? The band's gonna go in to play a song for just a little bit. Whatever you may be dealing with, Whatever struggle, whatever it is that you have in your life, don't just sit on it. Don't just sit there and hang on to it. Come up with somebody up front, partner with them that they can pray with you. Leave it here. Repent and turn away from that aspect. I'm not telling you you're not going to be tempted later on down the road because you're going to be. It's going to happen. The enemy is going to come after you, but you're going to be able to know when you start walking by the Spirit, you start listening to Him, He'll start showing you the areas in your life to start shedding and getting rid of. So as the band plays, I don't want anybody to leave yet. As the band plays, I want you to come forward. If you need prayer for anything, healing, whatever it may be,